So all that that we just talked about is simply setting the stage. Are we ready now to step into Reformation and modern church history? First chapter in Justo Gonzalez's second volume is the call for Reformation. We remember that that word Reformation, anytime we see the, the letters R, E at the beginning of a word in English, what does it mean? Again. So we're going to form the church again. We're going to form the church as Jesus would form it himself. If Jesus came back today, how would he form the church today? That's where we're going to reform the church. Follow me? So we're going to have different people who are taking a look at the church now, taking a look at these structures that we've built, these hierarchies, and we're going to say, wait a minute, would Jesus want this? Would Jesus want some of the things that are going on? They're going to say, it's time to reform the church. So the church was in need of reformation. Why do we say that? Justo Gonzalez goes into a litany of why we needed to reform the church. He said that the papacy in Rome, the, pope, the Pope's office, the papacy was corrupt. It was weakened by schism. Remember when we had two popes at the same time in France and in Italy, and then three popes because we threw out the two of them and created another one. Wait a minute, we had three popes at the same time. The, the papacy was corrupt, and it was the tool of various interests. If you're the Pope in France, got news for you, you're going to be influenced by the King of France and others closer to you. And so the, the, the question became, how do we continue to have faith in the papacy when we're so scandalized by the things that we see happening by Popes? Another issue was that bishops were profiting from all of this. Think about the system for a moment, okay? If I'm a cardinal here, and you want, to, you want your 20-year-old son to be an archbishop, okay, for $10,000 we can make him an archbishop, right? Bishops and archbishops and cardinals, both, everyone was profiting from this system. Are they going to be excited about changing it? The ostentatiousness of clergy was, betrayed as, it was perceived as betrayal of the poor. Ooh, think about that for a moment. Father Jamie, I'm glad that we, we had a collection to be able to buy him that, that chasuble, that new robe that he's wearing. But you know what? Instead of giving him that robe, we could have donated that money to wheel, Meals on Wheels or to elder care. You follow me? There were people who were essentially raising those issues back in the Middle Ages. Also, there was little education for local clergy. Ooh, think about the, the result of this for a moment. If, Bishop Johnson, if Archbishop Johnson comes to Austin tomorrow and just decides, let's go around the room and just ordain everyone, right? Let's just go around the room and ordain everyone. And it doesn't matter if this is Raphael's first day here. We're going to ordain Raphaela as well. Suddenly, what does that mean for the messages? They're going to be preached by different people? That could be dangerous. As part, of, as part of the reforms of the church, we came up with the seminary system. Why did we invent the seminary? So that everyone would receive a, a good, solid formation. The law of clerical celibacy wasn't enforced. was not enforced. We had a law. You have to be celibate. You can't have kids. You can't have sex. You can't have kids. You can't be married. And what was happening? Bishops and even popes were flaunting their illegitimate children. Okay, on the one hand, you're telling me I can't get married. On the other hand, you have kids. There's some contradiction here. Monasteries became centers of leisurely living, and the illegitimate children of royalty were often named abbots or abbesses. Remember, these abbots had control over you know, large groups of people and land. How do you get power from organizing one or two things? People and or resources, money. Abbots and abbesses were powerful. So if you were a king and you had an illegitimate son or daughter, eh, why not talk to the, the local bishop and see if you can get him or her as the abbot or the abbess of the local monastery. So there were various calls for reformation. The church, so We need to do something to reform this church. Is this church what Jesus intended it to be? In addition to the calls for reformation, there was also nationalism, which simply means that, that nations were popping up for the first time. We started thinking of ourselves as Italian for the first time, as Spanish, as French for the first time. New languages, when we talk about languages like French and Spanish and English, 
They date back to this period. The church's dream, remember in John chapter 10, Jesus says, one day there will be one flock with one shepherd. How did the Pope interpret that? There will be one flock, my flock, and who will be the shepherd? I, the Pope, will be the shepherd of this one flock. Okay, that started to make some of us nervous. Wait a minute, who is this Pope to, to think that he's going to be the one shepherd of the entire flock? Especially now that we're several countries, several language groups developing. Who is this guy in Italy thinking that he has power over us in England? Or in Spain, or in France, or in the Netherlands? Who does he think he is? Many were convinced that the teachings of the church had gone astray, that this can't be the church that Jesus wanted. And there was a call for a return to the scriptures, to the Bible, and to translate the Bible into the vernacular, into people's languages. If this is not the church that Jesus wants, where are we going to figure out the church that Jesus wanted? Let's go back to the Bible, people. You can't read Latin? That's okay. Let's translate the Bible from Latin into your language. Spanish, English, whatever your language is, let's translate it so that you can understand the Bible and understand what Jesus wanted for us. The printing press, how convenient. The printing press was invented around 1440. Where did we leave off with that last book? Around the middle of the 15th century. So it's going to be around this time with Martin Luther coming that he's going to have the invention of the printing press, which means that anything he writes about the church being, being wrong on certain things, you know what? We can print that and we can get copies to everyone in the town. Now that we have a printing press. There was a return to the humanities, which for them meant the ancient literary sources. In the same way that, that philosophers were going, uh, going back and reading the, you know, the early philosophers, you know, we're going back and reading these ancient texts. Why don't we do the same in the church? Go back to this, these ancient texts, the Bible, and begin retrieving those. There was a focus on the humanities, we call that. And so the people who focused on the humanities, what did we call them? We called them humanists. humanists. The humanists were the ones who were interested in going back to the sources. For our faith, they were going back to the Bible. The prince of humanists was a man named Erasmus. Have we heard of Erasmus before? Desiderius Erasmus was from Rotterdam in Holland. Lived from 1466 to 1536. So we're talking roughly at the same time as Martin Luther. He was the illegitimate son of a priest. What does it mean to be the illegitimate son of a priest? It meant that that priest had a child. I talk about it in my own family history. It was so scandalous in our family in the 1800s that my, that my great, great, great grandfather, Peter Huffbauer, was raised by his Aunt Susan. He learned later in life that where did he come from? His mother who cleaned the rectory was impregnated by whom? Absolutely scandalous. In this time then, Erasmus was in the same situation. <laughs> Erasmus was the Peter Huff power of that day, right? Mm -hmm. The illegitimate son of a priest and of a physician's daughter, he studied scholastic theology, meaning he studied people like St. Thomas Aquinas. We heard, do we remember that name, St. Thomas Aquinas? He's studying people like St. Thomas Aquinas, and he's thinking to himself, you know what, maybe instead of studying Aquinas, maybe we should be studying the Bible instead. <laughs> instead of reading what this guy is saying, maybe we should, we should be reading what God is saying in the Bible. And so he suggested that the pomp and the evil of the Renaissance popes and clergy and monks should be rejected, and that all of us should start living more as, he called them, he called the soldiers of Christ. That we should be more disciplined than essentially see ourselves as being soldiers for Christ. But is the struggle, is the Christian struggle like an outward fight? Are we going to go to war with one another? No, the Christian struggle is more inward. It's more, it's an inner fight that each of us has to, to wage. Erasmus, for instance, said, What good is it to be sprinkled with water, baptized? What good is it to be sprinkled with water on the outside to be baptized if you're filthy inside? Where was Jesus' focus? Did Jesus focus on the outside of the, the cup or the inside of the cup? 
He said, if there's dirt on the cup, you want the dirt to be on the outside of the cup. You don't want it in the inside of the cup where you're going to be pouring the water or the wine. No. Focus on the inside. Erasmus was saying the same. All these external things that you're doing, like being baptized, doesn't matter if you're dirty on the inside. In Spain, while all this is happening then with Erasmus and the humanities and all of this is happening in Spain then, which is, has traditionally been a very Catholic country, in Spain, back in 1492, oh, that was when Columbus discovered America, who, was, uh, who were the king and queen of Spain at that time? Ferdinand and Isabella. How interesting, because Spain was so Catholic, the Pope aligned himself with Spain and even put the Inquisition under Ferdinand and Isabella. What is the Inquisition? The Inquisition simply means that we're going to go around the room and we're going to have a test on our faith. And if you don't answer the questions correctly, this is your last date with us. The Inquisition. We tortured people, we killed people in the name of our faith. The Inquisition then was happening at that time. Uh, Tomás de Torquemada was heading it in Castillo, Castillo which was uh, where Isabel was from, in 1492. We remember that year for being the year when Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas, 1492. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. What else happened in that year? Two things. The Jews were expelled from Spain. If you are a Jew, you have two options. You can be baptized a Christian, or you can hit the road. 200,000 Jews hit the road, went into exile. We said the same thing to the Muslims. Back then we called them Moors, right? Remember Santiago Matamoros, St. James, the Muslim killer? We said to the Moors, the Muslims, you have two options. You can believe and be baptized, or you can hit the road. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't let them hit the road. Suddenly, we're not going to have anyone left in Spain. Recently, a, a young lady was responding to Donald Trump saying, you know, if it weren't for immigrants, who would be doing a lot of the jobs that we're doing here? In Spain, we had to ask her, wait a minute, if it weren't for the Moors, the Muslims, who's going to do a lot of these jobs here? Wait a minute. No, 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 no. Muslims, okay, we gave the Jews two options. Be baptized or leave. We're only giving you one option. What was the option? Be baptized. Were we able to enforce that? You better believe it. What was the office that we had to be able to enforce that now? We called it the Inquisition. The Inquisition was the person to go around and knock on doors to be able to see, okay, Andy, are you a real Christian? Have you converted? Were you baptized? Or are you still Muslim? Brain drain. Yes, when you do that, you do away with thinkers, and, and the only ones that stay are the ones that just you know, live day by day. The party people. You've got to sing, you gotta sing the Mickey Mouse song. You've got to stay in Spain, you've got to sing our song. 